Welcome to this latest edition in our video interview series here at ICANN. My name is Richard Albert, and along with Tom Ginsberg and David Landau, I'm founding co-editor of this blog, ICANNECT. Uh, today we're going to interview Felicia Caponigri, uh, uh, an early career scholar who is a program director in IP and technology law at the Notre Dame Law School, from where she earned her JD degree. She's also a recent doctoral uh, graduate from the IMT Luca uh, School. Felicia, so great to have you. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this and accepting my invitation. I'm really happy to have the chance to learn about your work and to showcase it with our readers and viewers. Well, thank you, Richard. This is a wonderful opportunity and I'm so excited to be interviewed. So let's just dive right in. What are you working on right now? Well, right now, as any recent PhD graduate can surely empathize with, I'm turning my dissertation into law review articles. So I'm expanding on the topic of how fashion is cultural property under Italian law. So looking at how fashion can be cultural property in source nations, but then also exploring what that means for market nations like the United States and specifically exploring whether there's a link uh, between copyrightable subject matter and cultural property. So if US copyright law acts at some moments in an ex ante way as cultural property does later on for certain objects, fashion, paintings, sculptures, and then parallel to that, I'm also working on a project on the Italo Balbo monument, um, which is a monument um, outside of, in Chicago by Soldier Field. And I'm exploring how that monument represents historic property and cultural property, and really is a great material example of Italian cultural property law and US historic preservation law. So I would say art law project, historic preservation project in parallel. You also have an interest in, in fashion law. Yes, yes, it's greatly so, yes. So, so really the part of fashion law that deals with cultural heritage. So we see a lot of luxury brand goods companies and fashion companies marketing their products now as part of heritage, as part of a history of their brand. And what effect does that have when we ascribe the same types of cultural value and we have the same type of public cultural interest in these objects as we do for a painting by Da Vinci or a sculpture by uh, Michelangelo? So what does that mean for our future? How are the modern things that we include in our own personal narratives as part of our identity, as part of our collective traditions? How are we going to treat them, whether in a museum or outside of it in the future? How are we going to inherit our future for fashion? I think your, your work is interesting because it also has relevance to uh, an ongoing debate uh, in the United States and indeed around the world, uh, public monuments. What do you do with, with those? Uh, that may be controversial, that may raise questions about their modern propriety. Yes, very much so. And it also really highlights how certain terms under the law are liminal notions. So legal terms that take their definition from other disciplines. So when we think of historic property, for example, history really informs how we interpret what is historic property. And when our historical narratives change, shouldn't our monuments change as well? But then when you think of a term like cultural property, how do we define culture? Um, how do we decide what is timeless, what we want to preserve and what maybe we don't want to preserve? So really highlighting the relationship between law and other disciplines. Hmm. What is historical is actually very, very interesting. The way one gets that designation of what is historical. I have a friend here in Austin, uh, in the state of Texas, um, property taxes are very, very high. So there's an incentive to get your home uh, designated as a historical site, because it turns out that under state law, you pay 50% less in tax. And so one can imagine that um, uh, there's an incentive, uh, one that people exploit um, to get their homes or certain properties designated as historical so they can take advantage of this, of this special tax break. Yes, and then you, know, you ask, well, are there dueling narratives? So is there something that makes it easier for one person to have their property 
um, benefit from the tax break, as you've said, than another? How is it that we decide, really, right, these big questions that also are related to constitutional law, right? How do we decide what is historic property for us as a collective, as a society? Really important questions for us today and for our future. Hmm. So Felicia, you've mapped out some of the work that you're doing now. Really exciting, really interesting. Um, but when do you do it? So how and when do you sit and, and write? Do you have a routine? So you wake up first thing in the morning and you start to write. Do you just write whenever the spirit moves you, whenever you have a moment here or there? When and how do you do it? Richard, that is such a good question. And my answer is I have a ideal routine and I have a reality routine. So my ideal routine is having a whole day to write. And I did this a lot with my dissertation. So I really enjoy getting up in the morning, having the whole day to write, taking breaks throughout the day, writing, uh, printing it out, editing, taking the time to read an article again or a section of a book, think some more, write. Um, but the, the issue, of course, with that is that your life often gets in the way, uh, as it does, beautifully. And so one has to um, reorganize. So I find often that what I do is I will write a number of drafts and they won't uh, be exactly what I want to say. And then I'll be someplace completely unexpected, uh, whether it's, you know, in, it often happens also in cultural institutions. So often I'll find I'll be in a museum and I'll see an object or I'll be even on a train. So modes of transportation really, uh, for some reason, activated. And I'll think exactly of what I want to say and I need to write it wherever I am and whatever is available. So my phone and my notes app has become a really great tool. Uh, and I always have my computer with me. And I find that when I leave my computer, um, just disastrous things happen anyway. So I always have it with me. And so I really, I write wherever and, and whenever I can. But I think listening really to, the, to, the, to your inner writing voice is very important. So I think that if you really listen to your thoughts, and listen to yourself as you work through an issue, then the, the writing just will come at whatever moment is, is proper. I like the way you put that, uh, Felicia, a very nice, a nice phrase that uh, life gets in the way beautifully. It reminds me of, uh, of, one, of the, um, one of the lines from one of the world's greatest philosophers, John Lennon, who, who wrote and sang that uh, life is what happens when you're busy making other plants. So true, so true. And the best, I think, research ideas come when you're making other plans too. When you are delving into a topic that maybe you think, oh, this is so on the periphery of my research, this is so on the periphery of my area, and then you'll really find a gem and you'll have a question and it will totally change your research or it will reshape it and reframe it in a certain way that you, you, in some ways, become you know, even more passionate about that topic than, than others. So it's, it's true. You, and mm. listening is very important. So you've told us a bit about your work. You've told us a bit about how you actually set about the task and the joy of writing. When did you know that this is the career that you wanted for yourself, the life of a scholar, a professor? Well, you know, I always was very, very comfortable in a classroom. So I remember ever since I was an undergrad, I really enjoyed being in a room with my colleagues, with my peers, and with my professor, talking through ideas, exploring questions that you know, maybe weren't exactly evident in a text we were reading, or you know, really just discussing. And having robust discussion, I think, is so important. And I always felt really comfortable in that environment. And then when I got to law school, I was really uh, struck by the work that my professors were doing. So I was really struck by the way that my professors would present a topic in class, but then research an area of it that maybe wasn't really at issue in, in a case, or you know, pull in comparisons from other sources of law in other jurisdictions that at first may not seem evident. And I really enjoyed that scholarship. And again, found that ability to discuss and talk and think through issues and application of laws in a very inquisitive, curious sense of wonder type of way. 
And so I think it wasn't an aha moment. It was really a gradual realization that this is what I wanted to do. Hmm. And, and what a great pleasure for you it must be to be back um, at your, your alma mater where you earned your, your JD. Yes, it really is. We're a wonderful community of scholars here, and I feel so honored to be here and to listen to my professors present their works in progress at the faculty colloquia. It's really, it's, it's a mm -hmm. great privilege. I'm sure they're happy to have you back there as well. When you were an undergraduate or even a JD student, did you encounter a book or maybe an article or some work of scholarship that was really meaningful to you back then and that continues today to have a, an influence on how you think and how you, how you write and how you go about the, the craft of being a scholar? I do. I have my second year of law school, I discovered John Henry Merriman's three articles on the Italian style. He wrote three, one on the law, one on doctrine, and one on interpretation. And I found them when I was writing my note um, on who, who owns Villa La Pietra, this villa outside of Florence. And it really was, a, was an excellent example to me and really inspirational for how to delve deep into another you know culture's interpretation and legal tradition um, and you know how to think about Italian and American uh, legal relations so that was and that continues uh, for me to be a really exemplary uh, trio uh, of, of articles and then in my third year of law school I discovered uh, Alfred C. Yen's copyright and aesthetic theory I remember I was in copyright class and I was reading these uh, legal cases and I thought, gee, some of this legal reasoning sounds a lot like what I learned in art history class. You know, there's, maybe there's a link between this legal reasoning and some art historical methodologies. And I found Alfred Cien's article, which, which shows just that, which really maps uh, certain legal reasonings onto aesthetic theories that are present in art history. And that still, to me, it's an example of how to use other disciplines with the law in a way that can positively affect change and promote understanding of the law. Hmm. Well, that's exciting. Exciting. Thanks for sharing that, um, that, that memory, uh, an important memory, I think, that uh, continues to have an impact on what you do today. Well, Felicia, I've taken up so much of your time already. Uh, you probably want to go back to your writing. So let me just uh, ask one more question. Part of the purpose of this series of interviews that we do with scholars is to showcase some of the work um, that our interviewees are doing. So is there an article or a paper or a book or work in progress or something um, that you might tell us about uh, and that also you'd give me permission to link on the blog when I publish this interview so that our readers can read uh, what you're working on and get to know you through your scholarship. Of course. So there's there's one article that I wrote called The International Display of Fashion in the Museum. And it's a really important article for me because I saw something in the real world that intrigued me uh, that, you know, some people may may also have seen, which is the Met Gala. So every year the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Costume Institute specifically throws this wonderful annual ball to raise money for the Costume Institute along with their annual exhibition. And I remember I was watching it and I was watching the documentary about one uh, iteration of, of the gala, the first Monday in May. And I thought to myself, you know, this is, this is interesting. I wonder what's, what's happening here. I wonder if there's some sort of conflict of interest. Uh, you know, we, we see fashion up here in the museum and we see fashion editors who promote specific fashion and it enters the museum and museums are spaces of public trust. They're spaces where well, we go to learn um, very, you know, fair, um, if I might use the term narratives and, you know, that represent all members of our community. So I'm wondering if there's, if, if maybe I could explore what museum guidelines say and what the law has to say about it. So I wrote this article on um, applying the ICOM code of ethics and um, exploring how it is customary international law and how it applies to the uh, facts that we see laid out in the documentary the first Monday of May with Anna Wintour and Andrew Bolton and I talk about a broad um, you, you know uh, a broad conflict of interest in a 
a, um, a more narrow. So it's so it's it's a really a great um, a great article that I really enjoy because I I saw something in the real world, and as all scholars do, I just said I'll research it and see if I find find an answer. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's just enough, Felicia, to pique our interest and to go right. and, and read the and read the the paper because uh, we'll link to it and we'll encourage our readers to have a to have a look. Uh, Felicia uh, Caponigri, thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us this afternoon um, to allow us to learn about you and, and your work. Thank you, Richard, again for inviting me. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.